Hello, this is part two of the causal graph tutorial on colliders. When we do science, one of the fundamental problems is confounds. So we want to detect or measure the relationship between two variables, but there are other variables, other explanations that uh, we might be picking up on and that we might need to control for or uh, get rid of somehow. Uh, we all have an intuitive idea of how that works. But causal graphs gives us an explicit way of expressing this problem. And the problem is that causality follows causal arrows, but correlation can flow both ways around uh, a causal graph. That's a kind of metaphor that's used uh, to express this idea. So let's have a look at this uh, example causal graph. We have the variable x and the variable y, and we're interested in the causal effect of x and y. We think changing x will cause y to change. And we can do some observations uh, of x and y to see if there's some kind of relationship. Uh, however, the, there are these other variables that are also linked uh, to both x and y. And because correlation can sort of flow both ways, uh, there's a correlation uh, between x and y. We would expect uh, to see a correlation between x and y even if there was no direct uh, link, no direct causal effect. So now when we make our observations, we can't necessarily tell whether uh, the relationship we see is a causal relationship directly of x on y, or a correlation that's caused by these other variables uh, in what's called a backdoor path. Uh, so this is the fundamental problem, and we can use causal graphs to help us think about this. Of course, this assumes that uh, this model of the world is a good model, uh, but that's a kind of separate question. So one of the obvious ways to get around this problem is to run an experiment. And formally, what an experiment does is uh, creates an intervention. So we sort of randomly uh, manipulate x, randomly assign x, uh, and now what we hope is that any uh, relationship we detect between x and y uh, is only uh, the causal relationship. Because we sort of randomly set everything else, we've broken this link uh, between the other variables, and now correlation can't flow around uh, the diagram in any other way. So that's the aim. Uh, we can use causal graphs to try and help us think about what are possible confounds uh, and how we can get around them. But it's not always possible to do uh, an intervention experiment. Sometimes we need to control for things. And what I, the argument I'm going to try and make uh, is that you need a causal graph to determine what you need to control for. Uh, and I'm going to explain that over the next few slides. All right, let's take uh, a concrete example. Let's say that we're uh, interested in uh, the medical effects of a particular medicine. And we think taking this medicine will have a causal effect on your health. We want to measure that effect. Uh, but we also know that uh, your age affects your health. We also might suspect uh, that your age might affect whether you take the medicine or not. So if you think about uh, this being a clinical trial uh, over several months, we instruct people to uh, take their medicine, but some people, um, maybe due to the underlying problem itself, uh, forget. Uh, and the older you are, the more likely you are to forget to take your medicine. So this might introduce a confound. Let's have a look. Well, correlation follows the arrow, so we're interested in the effect of taking medicine on health. But now there's a correlational uh, uh, path between taking medicine and health. Uh, and if we were to observe taking medicine uh, and uh, people's health, uh, without doing something about this uh, causal path, we'd expect to see um, some sort of relationship. So we're not sure whether the observation, the strength of the observation, is really just the causal effect, or partly the causal effect, partly the correlational effect, uh, through this other path. So again, if we were to randomly assign who takes the medicine and who doesn't, or do some, give some people uh, medicine, give some people placebo, hopefully that would break the association between age and whether you're really taking the medicine. 
that would allow us to uh, say, okay, if this is a complete picture of the world, uh, then uh, we can now measure the effect of taking medicine on health. Another way to do it would be to use some sort of statistical control. So take lots of observations of medicine, your health and your age, and then use, for example, a statistical regression to control for the effect of age. Uh, formally, what that does is break the uh, causal connections between these two things so that we can measure uh, this other effect more clearly. That's the ideal case. All right, so what's the problem? Um, we could just, for example, uh, measure as many things as we could, and throw them all into uh, a statistical model to make sure that we're controlling for as many things as possible. And there are two problems with that. One is quite well known, and one is only starting to be uh, realized. The well known one is that the more variables you have in your model, you have uh, problems with the estimation of that model. Uh, you, you'll need very large statistical power uh, the more uh, controls that you have, uh, and it might lead to uh, artifacts in uh, the what the model is actually telling you. The, the, the more unknown problem is that sometimes adding things to control in your model actually causes confounds when there weren't any there before. Uh, I'm going to show you how that works. All right, let's start with the basics. Uh, this is the classic problem in getting explanations out of observations. So let's say that we see a correlation between X and Y. We can't actually tell just from that correlation whether it's X causally influencing Y or whether Y causally influences X. Both of those situations would lead to a correlation. So we can't tell the difference between them. Uh, however, that's not the, uh, so these are just uh, relationships between two variables. Uh, and it turns out if we start thinking about more than two variables, uh, we can actually start to see some differences. So, uh, for example, Jude Pearl asks us to think about these four situations. What if there's some kind of extra variable Z? Uh, well, here are four ways these things could be related. I want you to think about uh, whether we would expect a correlation between X and Y in each of these conditions. And I just want you to pause the video uh, and have a think about that now. All right, so the first situation. Uh, here X affects Z and Z affects Y. It seems just intuitively that uh, X and Y would be correlated if there's enough power, if the strength of these causal relations is enough for us to observe these changes. Similarly, uh, uh, if the causality flows in the opposite direction, we'd also expect to see a correlation. The uh, third case is a sort of case of common cause. So Z influences both X and Y. And here we'd also expect to see uh, a correlation. However, in the final case, uh, we might not expect to see a correlation. Uh, and that's because, so X influences Z and Y influences Z. So now we'd expect to see a correlation between X and Z and a correlation between Y and Z, but not necessarily between uh, X and Y. We can change X and Y independently uh, and they won't affect each other. Uh, so in this case, if uh, we were to find no correlation between X and Y, we might be in this situation rather than uh, any of the other three. And now, um, now I want you to think about what would happen if we controlled for Z, either with an experiment or statistically. What would happen uh, to the correlation between X and Y in that case? You know, pause the video and see if you can have a think about that. All right, here's the answer. So um, in each of the three cases above, if we controlled for Z, if we sort of fixed Z, then we wouldn't expect to see an, uh, a correlation between X and Y. In the first case and the second case, that's kind of obvious. So um, uh, X 
uh, influences Z, but now we're sort of fixing Z. So there's no causal path, there's no way of information getting from X to Y. So we wouldn't see a correlation. Same thing for the second case. Uh, the third case, uh, if Z is always the same, if we sort of uh, statistically control for that, we're removing these correlations, uh, these causal uh, effects. Uh, and so X and Y uh, wouldn't be correlated. In other words, uh, if we fix Z, then there's no way for the, so this causal arrow means that if we were to change Z, X would also change. If Z isn't changing, then X isn't affected. However, the third, uh, the, the final uh, case is a bit different. So in this case, if we were to control for Z, then X and Y would become correlated. And now this is an interesting difference between the first three structures and the final one. Uh, and you might already get a clue of what we're trying to do here. And we might be able to tell what kind of situation we're in based on how these variables uh, behave. Uh, and also, it might be a really big problem uh, if this is, it is, is real. So if we were to control for Z, we would create a sort of artificial correlation between X and Y when there wasn't one there before. I'm going to try and explain uh, why that uh, works uh, in a couple of slides now. So let's imagine you and me are working at a uh, water processing plant. Uh, and it's our job to uh, control the flow of water uh, through these pipes. So uh, uh, this is me here. I can turn my little wheel to increase or decrease the flow of water as I like. Uh, and you can do the same. Uh, you also have uh, a, a little handle to increase or decrease the flow of water. Uh, water flows through both our pipes and comes out uh, here through Z, and we can measure the rate of flow of water, how much water is coming out. So the, the causal structure of this system uh, is like here at the bottom. So uh, I can uh, change the, I can affect how much water is coming out at Z, and you can also affect how much water is coming out at Z. But uh, if I if I change, uh, if I turn my wheel, that doesn't have any influence on whether you turn your wheel. We're, we're both independent, X and Y are independent. However, if we were to, uh, our boss comes along and says, okay, we need uh, this certain amount of flow to come out uh, at all times. And it needs to be steady and always this amount. Uh, in that case, if I were to turn my wheel up to increase the flow, to create the same flow at Z, you would have to decrease your uh, flow. And similarly, if you were to uh, increase your side, I would have to adjust to compensate by turning down my side. So now, if, we, if we're aiming to keep Z constant, there, there is a relationship between what I do and what you do. There's a correlation that's been caused by fixing the value of Z. This is the collider structure. Uh, I'm going to explain that uh, in a slightly different way. That's uh, a bit more like a, uh, a regression. So let's say that uh, we are running a farm and we're filling uh, sacks uh, with potatoes and carrots uh, to sell. Uh, and we know that uh, we want, we're measuring the weight of each of the sacks. Uh, and we know that uh, adding more potatoes changes the weight, and adding more carrots changes the weight. And those two things are independent. Uh, so putting one potato in doesn't mean that we can't put a certain number of other carrots in. Uh, and if we were to make observations of all the sacks of vegetables that we have, uh, imagining that we have different sizes and different amounts in each, we could look at the correlation between the number of potatoes in a sack and the number of carrots in a sack. And we would probably see no relationship between these things. However, let's say that we controlled for the weight of the sack. So we split 
uh, all the sacks into uh, their different sizes. We actually see that there are three different sizes of sack, one kilogram, two kilograms, and three kilograms. Now within each of these types of sack, there is a relationship between the number of potatoes and the number of carrots. So if we're saying we have to keep this sack, uh, this sack has to be one kilogram uh, exactly, then if I put more potatoes in, you have to put less carrots in to make up the one kilogram. And similarly, the same relationship is in the two kilograms and the three kilogram sack. So now we've revealed a relationship between potatoes and carrots, a correlation by controlling for weight. So once again, uh, controlling for the central variable in a collider creates a kind of artificial correlation between the number of potatoes and the number of carrots. Oh, the two variables on the outside, if you're not interested in potatoes and carrots. And we're not, because we're linguists. So let's look at a linguistics uh, example. Let's say that we're interested in the effect of uh, the length of a word on your reaction time to uh, uh, reading that word or uh, deciding whether it's a real word or not. Uh, so we run uh, a little test where we give people a load of words uh, and we just measure their reaction times. Let's build a little bit of a more realistic uh, picture of uh, the world. So let's say that we, we also know the frequency of words and the valence of words, uh, how positive or negative uh, they make us feel. So we might uh, add some extra uh, arrows in here. So for example, uh, Zipf might say that the length of a word causally affects how frequent it is. Uh, Boucher and Osgood might say that the uh, valence of a word affects its frequency, so we're more likely to use more positive words. And Cooperman and Al uh, suggest that uh, more positive words are recognized uh, more quickly. Or actually, maybe it's more negative words. I forget. Anyway, there's uh, a causal relationship between valence and reaction time. So this is just one possible uh, picture of the world. But let's say that we're, we're dedicated to this uh, model of the world. Uh, in this case, uh, there is a collider in the system, uh, and hopefully you, know, you spotted it here. Um, so the question is, which of these variables, if we're interested in the effect of length on reaction time, which of these variables should we control for? Because there's a collider here, um, uh, we have to be careful about this. So it's true that there is a, a correlation, a correlational path. Uh, there's uh, this path, uh, is, is, there's a possible path from length to reaction time uh, through these other variables. However, we know that uh, this collider structure blocks the correlation between length and valence. If we were to control for frequency, we know that we would introduce an artificial correlation between length and valence, and suddenly we've created a confound that wasn't there before. Uh, we, in other words, we've opened up an alternative route for the correlation to flow uh, from length to reaction time. That's different from the causal path that we're interested in. So uh, if we really believe this was how the world worked, we should not control for frequency, which is really unintuitive, I think, uh, if you've been doing these kinds of experiments. Uh, and I want to show you that, that this isn't just a sort of hypothetical uh, thing that happens in extreme cases. So this is not like uh, the insistence on having normal distributions that may affect uh, your um, outcomes. This is a, a real problem that really happens uh, in, uh, in data. Uh, I mean, you should check that your model, your, your data affects your assumptions, meets your assumptions, of course, but uh, that's a different kind of problem from this. Anyway, 
So here, um, let's do uh, a little uh, experiment of our own. Let's say uh, that we we can create some fake data, some made-up data that uh, behaves uh, like uh, this picture of the world. So uh, we have our variable length, uh, and that's just uh, uh, randomly determined. Uh, valence is also randomly determined. But then frequency is affected by length and valence. Uh, so frequency is just length plus valence plus some extra noise. Uh, and then reaction time is affected by just valence uh, plus some noise. So uh, this is some R code. Uh, if you uh, understand R, you can follow along. Um, so now what we might want to do is create a model. We're trying to predict reaction time by length. And given this picture of the world, given the way that we've created the variables, we know that there's no relationship. We should not expect a correlation between these things. And in fact, that's what we found. So uh, the, this is the um, uh, coefficient for length. Uh, it's uh, this amount, but uh, this is not statistically different from uh, no effect. So the probability here is high. Okay, this all makes sense. We created a world where there's no relationship between length and reaction time, and we didn't find any. But now what happens if we run the same model, but we also add frequency into the model. So we're controlling for frequency, controlling for this central part of the collider. Now what we find is that uh, frequency is a significant predictor uh, of reaction time, but also length is a significant predictor. Uh, in other words, we've opened up uh, a correlation between length and valence by controlling for frequency. Uh, and that creates a relationship between length and reaction time that wasn't there before. So if, if you've ever been uh, playing around with statistical models, and uh, adding in different things, and you see that one of your effects uh, is significant in one model, but then you take some stuff out and it's not significant anymore, maybe something like this is happening. That you have somewhere in your uh, uh, in your variables, you have a collider structure. When you control for one of those things, you're creating confounds that weren't there before. Of course, this depends uh, on getting the picture of the world right. And I'm not saying that uh, this is the correct picture. Uh, there are many possible models. Some of them have colliders uh, where you shouldn't control for frequency, and some of them uh, don't have colliders where you should control for frequency. My point is that your hypotheses affect the design of your statistical model. The way you think the world works uh, affects which variables you should control for. Throwing all your variables into a model might actually make your ability to infer what's happening worse than it was before. You might be introducing confounds, but that depends on your uh, theory of the world. So to state the problem I've been trying to make, uh, uh, make in this uh, video, controlling for some things removes spurious correlations. So that's the standard way of controlling for things uh, in a statistical model to get rid of the, the influence of that in our observations. But controlling for other things creates spurious correlations. So what's the solution? Well, I'm going to propose five uh, solutions uh, quickly. Uh, the first solution is to collaborate with people. So that's a way of getting good data, good methods, and good theories. Uh, it's also more fun. Second solution is to adopt a robust approach to explanation. So try and use multiple approaches, multiple analyses of data, and multiple sources of data, hopefully getting at a, a, a clearer picture of what's happening by proving the same kind of thing from multiple different angles. Solution three is to take an incremental approach. So uh, proving causal effects is really hard. 
And we shouldn't try to do everything at once. We shouldn't try to throw everything into one paper, for example. Uh, we should have modest goals for our papers, not so modest interpretations. So if we find a relationship between two variables, we shouldn't sell this as shocking proof of a theory, uh, just uh, an observation that uh, may need more testing uh, later. And even just demonstrating a robust correlation um, these days takes an awful lot of work to uh, uh, argue against all possible interpretations. Uh, fourth solution is to use causal graphs to express our ideas. So they help us to be more explicit about our hypotheses. They help us identify confounds, and I'm going to talk a bit about that in the next video. They focus on the critical differences between hypotheses. So we can identify, uh, if we're testing two different hypotheses, we can focus on the real key difference. And they help uh, identify connections between theories. So if we're trying to say, okay, uh, here's my experiment, and here is how this other uh, theory uh, relates to it, we can be really formal about that and explain why we're including things uh, in our models uh, and why we might not be including things. So here's my conclusion. Big data brings many opportunities and challenges, and meeting them will require building better causal models. That's what I think. Big data, so we want to do better research. Big data is going to be a part of that. But I think better causal models uh, also needs to be a part of that. To build better causal models, we need to collaborate with people, and that also helps us get big data. It also helps us do a robust approach. It's very hard these days to uh, be an expert on multiple different statistical techniques and experimental techniques uh, and data collection and the theory. We need to work together uh, to create uh, better causal models. Then incremental approaches and causal approaches uh, also contribute to this as well. And the final solution I'm going to suggest is uh, SHIELD. So this is a database of uh, causal hypotheses, other people's hypotheses expressed as causal graphs. Uh, it's a tool to help us uh, collect these ideas, to help us combine them, uh, and help us do all the things that I, I've been talking about. In the next video, I'm going to do some practical uh, practice of uh, looking at a causal graph and planning your statistical approach uh, to uh, including uh, identifying confounds uh, and being careful about how you treat colliders. Thanks.